Seek ye therefore first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be added unto you. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On January 25th in the year 1959, Pope John XXIII gave a famous sermon at that major basilica in Rome as known as St. Paul Outside the Walls. In short, the sermon served as an introductory theme for what would become known as the Second Vatican Council. Pope John XXIII called upon the Holy Ghost in that sermon praying, quote, Renew your wonders in this our day as by a new Pentecost, unquote. A new Pentecost he wished for. In his mind, the upcoming council would bring down the Holy Ghost upon the council fathers as it once came down upon the apostles and the disciples gathered in that upper room on Pentecost Sunday. It would be a new springtime for the church where she would truly flourish. What Pope John XXIII had in mind was a grandiose council, not simply a continuation or a completion of Vatican I. And one of the most unusual and truly innovative aspects of this new council was that it would not confine itself just to theological or disciplinary matters amongst Catholics, but it would tackle larger-than-life issues dealing with world peace, interreligious dialogue, and yes, the opening up of the windows of the church and letting in the fresh air of the Holy Ghost as if the third person of the Blessed Trinity had had limited access to the church before the council. In another sermon of Pope John XXIII, the actual address that opened up the Second Vatican Council in October of 1962, the Pope spoke of a need for a, quote, new enthusiasm, a new joy with the truths of the faith being studied in a new way and adapted to modern man. And for those who were the naysayers who were warning about this issue, for those who spoke of a coming calamity and future disasters as foretold by Our Lady of Fatima and Sister Lucia, John XXIII claimed that these prophets of doom, these Fatimists, failed to read the signs of the times. Finally, this Pope spoke of his distaste for condemnations of error, preferring instead the power of persuasion and the balm of mercy, replacing all that severity. With the opening of the Second Vatican Council, there was such a general euphoria, so much enthusiasm. Of all the ecumenical councils in the past, this would be the largest in terms of attendance by far with cardinals, bishops, and religious superiors, theologians, and observers from all over the world. Never before had the church shown herself to be so Catholic, so universal. The enthusiasm and excitement was almost tangible. You could feel it. The Second World War was over. Europe was recovering well. It was an American century with the virtual Camelot, we were told, present on Pennsylvania Avenue. And in this Kennedy-esque-like atmosphere, with all of its optimism, where even the moon was within reach, perhaps the new church council could soar to spiritual heights beyond our imagining. Even the red menace of Marxist communism, Russia spreading her errors as warned of by Our Lady of Fatima, even this communism spread and the Cuban Missile Crisis, which happened just a week after the council opened, nothing could damper the enthusiasm. Springtime, New Pentecost. As we look back upon that event that occurred nearly 60 years ago, we realize that it did not necessarily bring forth a new springtime, nor was it necessarily like a new Pentecost. In fact, we might be tempted to mock certain people at that time for their naivete and misplaced optimism. 
What have we seen in the years following the council? Has it been a new springtime? I mean, let's just look at the evidence. Far from it. We rather have a winter of unbelief. We have empty seminaries, shuttered up parishes, crisis level priest shortages, trendy liturgies, not to mention worldwide clergy scandals, a general loss of faith, and an exodus of Catholics from the church. What has happened to the church since 1965? Why did the church suddenly seem to lose her identity even after the council? Where is the much vaunted springtime and new Pentecost? We opened up the windows to the world and an invasion of worldly thinking came in. We dialogued with the Athenians and the Areopagus and we became ever more assimilated to the spirit of the world. We mingled with modern day Canaanites. We married their pagan ways. And instead of being 11, a catalyst in consecrating the world to Christ, Catholics became like everybody else, an ingredient in a worldly mire. Let's be more specific. I mean, just evidence. Between 1930 and 1965, when the church was vibrant and even militant in the United States, the number of priests skyrocketed from about 27,000 to nearly 60,000. During the pontificate of Pius XII alone, the size of Catholics in this country doubled just in one pontificate. But today, the decline is so bad that by 2021, there will be some 30,000 priests with less than 15,000 of these under the age of 70. Priestless parishes are increasing each and every year. And with a 90% decrease in seminarians, if that continues, it's not going to get better in the near future. Of course, the priest shortage is not felt so much today since the numbers of people attending Sunday Mass has plummeted, forcing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of parishes to close throughout our country. How many schools have closed as well? How many convents? have closed because they're empty. During the council, 105,000 religious sisters taught in Catholic schools just in the United States. But today, in these post-conciliar years, the number is under 8,000. Despite an increase in the Catholic population of America, infant baptisms have dropped by 50%. And for those who are baptized, who grew up going to Sunday Mass and receive other sacraments, many do not actually accept the church's doctrinal or moral teachings. In short, Holy Mother Church in the United States and in the West is bleeding out, it's hemorrhaging, and various tourniquets applied by some in the clergy have not done enough. And now we deal with the various limitations imposed on us and the membership of the church in connection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, or what has been termed by some COVID-19 rubrics. It seems that many churches have taken on the appearance similar to that of a medical clinic than more of a consecrated space meant for the worship of God. And with the general universal dispensation from Sunday worship, offered to Catholics of all ages, of all health conditions, we are seeing a dropping off of interest in worshiping the good Lord through the holy sacrifice of the mass. Sheep require a shepherd. And the longer that people are away, the greater the likelihood they're going to wander off completely from the flock. They're going to forget the sound of their shepherd's voice. I mean, in California to this day, you still can't have mass indoors. You can't. They're going to forget the sound of their shepherd's voice because they can't go to church. A bishop in the southwest of our country just announced that priests who go over a five-minute sermon limit will have their faculties to preach removed. 
The same bishop demands that only the Novus Ordo Eucharistic prayer number two, the shortest, can ever be prayed during this COVID-19 crisis. And of course, Holy Communion can only be received in the hand. No exceptions. There were problems with reverence at Mass before the virus. I think we can agree. I wonder what reverence will be like after the virus. Observers have noted the following about the consequences of this virus. One person stated, quote, the sense of obligation to be in church every week is definitely weaker today than it was a generation ago. Think about it. After the 9-11 terrorist attacks, which we'll remember that anniversary soon, after the 9-11 terrorist attacks or any past threats like natural disasters, people would flock to the churches and pray, and they would go to confession. But this virus lockdown sent people away. The same observer added, quote, people who stop attending church rarely develop or maintain spiritual practices at home. I mean, are there readings of the scriptures at home on Sundays, praying the rosary? If there's no community to give you a feeling of obligation or a belonging, it's very tempting to simply not do anything at all. Churches will need to act fast to stop potential departures. I think it was much easier to close up the churches than it's going to be to reopen them. So much for the new Pentecost and the new springtime. But with all this being said, traditional-minded Catholics ought to be careful very careful in describing our times in the church and in the world in completely pessimistic ways, as if our times, the era in which we live, are somehow the worst period in human history. We like to paint the past as if it were a golden age, whereas our present life is supposedly only filled with woes. But this would be an incorrect evaluation. You see, since the fall of Adam and Eve, mankind has not been promised on earth a life of pure security and peace. We're not promised a perpetual springtime in this life. It's not guaranteed. We, as well as our ancestors, have lived in a fallen world in a valley of tears. The great church father, the greatest, the doctor of grace, St. Augustine once observed, quote, is there any affliction now endured by mankind that was not endured by our ancestors before us? What sufferings of ours even bear comparison with what we know of their sufferings? And yet we hear people complaining about this present day and age because things were so much better in former times. I wonder, St. Augustine continued, I wonder what would happen if they could be brought back to the days of their ancestors. Would we not still hear them complaining? You might think past ages were good, but it is only because you were not living in them. From the time of the first Adam, the time of his descendants today, man's lot has been labor and sweat, thorns and thistles." Unquote. Was the worldwide flood a part of this golden age of the past, where outside of eight people, the rest of mankind drowned in the waters? Have we had to deal with anything like the Aryan crisis in the fourth century, where 95% of bishops literally denied the divinity of Christ? They were apostates. Do you really think that priestly scandals today involving impurity an abuse were somehow unknown to Catholics of previous ages, say during the time of St. Peter Damien or St. Vincent Ferrer or St. Joseph Colossans. Read about those saints. Read about these past ages. They weren't a springtime either. Does the COVID situation in any way equal the Black Death? where 50% of Europe succumbed to the bubonic plague, including a large number of priests, which left the laity without mass, and in some cases without any proper catechesis. 
The riots today in our streets and many urban centers, do they really compare with the barbarians like the Huns and the Mongols and the Vikings taking over entire villages and cities? It seems that we tend to exaggerate our troubled times while forgetting that men of the past had to persevere oftentimes through a lot worse than us. And even if you were to look back at the golden age, because there was one, of Eden itself, before the fall, in that paradise with Adam and Eve, did they really have it better than we do? They were immortal. They would not die. They were without any suffering, no tears. But we have the word made flesh. They didn't. Substantially present upon our altars and in the tabernacle, the Son of God and Son of Mary. They had the tree of life, but we have the saving victim, God come in the flesh, hanging from the tree of the cross. And that is why we pray with St. Ambrose, O happy fault, O necessary sin of Adam, which brought to us so great a Redeemer. We have it better than Adam and Eve before the fall. And so we may rightly conclude that the optimism and enthusiasm of the Council Fathers of Vatican II was over the top. We often fall prey to false enthusiasm, but we ought not to claim that things now are worse than ever. Again, as St. Augustine stated, you may think past ages were good, but it's only because you are not living in them. Dear people, we were meant for this time, for this age. For us, it's a golden age, a golden opportunity. It may not be a springtime, and you know what? It never was. But it is the best time for us to flourish spiritually. It may not be a new Pentecost, but we are fortunate to live with the Holy Ghost in this time after Pentecost. These times are the best for us as our families and individuals to achieve our salvation. Because God creates everyone in a very specific way. He knows all the numbers of the hairs of our head on our head. He created us in a very specific way for a particular time, for a particular place. And what a blessing it is to be in this age because this is the most conducive for our salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.